Thanks for having me. Uh, special thanks to all the organizers and the volunteers for making this an awesome conference. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here again. It's been a few years for me. And so I'm really simply delighted just to be with people. And I don't know if you enjoy being with people. Uh, I, I just want to give you an opportunity now. To, if you want to stand up or just say hello to your neighbor, give a high five, handshake, a hug if you want. I mean, yeah, it's... Yeah, it's good. To... We're in person. This is great. Humanizing. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, great. So, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, this, this made-up concept. It's, if, if you don't know what this word means, it's because I just kind of made it up. Actually, no, Google, uh, Google Bard Generative AI tells me that it is actually a Japanese phrase. Uh, so, uh, but... In the work that I do, and maybe like the work you do, uh, it's so, so frustrating sometimes when we, we try to have people change, right? We're trying to help you, uh, and yet it's, it, it's difficult. I don't know if anyone feels... The, the metaphor I, I think of is it's like pushing a string sometimes. And uh, that's, that's what it feels like. And um, So anyway, so hopefully we're going to be able to discover, and I'd like your feedback as we go to. I'm, I'm fairly informal with these kind of talks, so if you have ideas... I don't have all the ideas. I have a few that I've collected. I'll present to you. But if you have, that's the power of the group here today, right? So anyway, so uh, just first off, it does have a meaning. So it's this idea of easy change or easy to convert. All right, so uh, when, when it's easy to do something, uh, it's almost like if you're familiar with this, the, the old book. Is anybody old enough to remember this book? Early web design. <laughs> I, 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 love, I, I love the concept, though. So when I think about change, uh, it's, you know, really, how do we find those, those places to hack the system uh, to do things where it makes it just easy for things to happen? It, it's less frustrating for change agents. It's, it's less frustrating for the people that we're trying to help. Uh, so it's really this concept of not making people think. Don't, don't make people think it's change, right? It's just easy. It make, we, we create a path that it's easy to follow in. Uh, so uh, not long ago, my, my wife sent me this article. I don't know if anyone ever feels this way. <laughs> Uh, or you could fill in, why does my customer reject all of my good ideas? Uh, of course, they're all good ideas, so why would they reject them? Uh, so uh, this is an interesting story about basically what's going on. It's not necessarily your ideas. It's maybe not even your boss. Your boss isn't necessarily evil. Your customer isn't evil. But there's something going on that we need to pay attention to that's making it difficult to change. Uh, so uh, if you're familiar with uh, Lewin's uh, kind of heuristic formula for, for uh, behavior. So basically, behavior is a function of the person and environment. So this has been helpful for me just because uh, I have a colleague who kind of introduced this, this to me and, and it was really kind of coaching from this stance to be aware that uh, oftentimes it feels very personal, right? It feels like what's wrong with you as a person, what's wrong with me as a change agent? Uh, but oftentimes we're thinking about how people are behaving in a particular environment. So I actually, there's uh, a friend I have who started at a company recently, and uh, he's, he's like two months into the, his new job, right? And so he can already sense that he, he wants to do the right things, and yet he's sensing what the environment is telling him. He's responding to environmental variables, responding to motivators, uh, incentives in the system. And so he's basically living this, right? So what does it mean to, if you're a person, you want to do the right thing, you know what the right thing is, but oftentimes we're working in an environment that makes it uh, hard to do that. So I think of this as, uh, as growing, I, I like to drink wine, uh, so I, the metaphor of, of uh, a grape uh, in a vineyard is helpful here because oftentimes we see the thing that's above the surface, right? So if we think about culture, and this comes from the, the Kanban culture mantra, basically <laughs> outcomes follow practices, follow culture, which follows values. And the, the, the difficult part here is that oftentimes we intervene in a system at the practices level where you train or we, we sprinkle good practices on people. And uh, it seems like that should work. Uh, but we're not paying attention to what's below the surface or what's in the soil. And so I want to encourage us to think not only about the practices, practices are good, but to think about what's below that, 
uh, if you're if you're just scattering seeds on the sidewalk, uh, those seeds are not going to grow very long. Right? They're going to die, and so oftentimes this happens, right? So uh, the example of my friend who's he wants to do the right thing, he knows what good practices are, and yet the the soil is not conducive to him doing those things. So. The culture, we might think of that as kind of this, this cyclical process of values, whether they're stated or unstated, the structures of an organization. And so paying attention to the structures is actually really helpful because we've got all sorts of things, and you, you can probably think of your own example of what is the structure? What is the structure of the environment? Uh, what's going on here? So all the different kind of motivators that, they're, again, sometimes they're explicit, sometimes they are not. And sometimes it takes you a while to even realize what is going on in the system. So it's taken me a year or more at some places to realize, oh, this is why people do this. <laughs> they have this built-in system of how they're rewarded or how they're punished or what the career uh, paths look like. And so you can see different policies, how we measure things. Obviously, that can be a driver of behavior. So these things kind of work in conjunction with each other. So the culture, the values, uh, and the structures. And sometimes one follows the other, sometimes the other informs the other one. So uh, paying attention to that whole, some people you know, kind of just focus on culture, but to me it's a little bit bigger picture. It's not quite as simple as that. All right, so when we think about leverage as change agents, uh, when we focus only on the practices uh, without understanding the culture, without understanding the structures, uh, we oftentimes, the, the practices themselves are not only not doing what we need them to, but we're actually, uh, in some cases, making things worse. I don't know if you, if you introduce yourself as an agile coach or you come in and you're going to say, oh, we're going to do some, some scrum stuff or some Kanban stuff or flow stuff. And you try it, and because there's, there's a, a very poor environment, it ends up actually being worse than when you started. Uh, so one, one company I went to, I, I knew one of the developers in the organization, and when I got there, I said, oh, he said, oh, what are you doing? It's so nice to have you in the organization. I said, oh, I'm, I'm doing agile coaching stuff. And he said, oh, well, we've had your agile coaching. No, thank you very much. Uh, because the, the group had gone through and coached them, uh, which basically was just kind of like compliance to some practices. And uh, they, they, were, they, they did not want me around. Uh, right, so and actually, and we see that all the time, uh, where failed transformations, people, it's not a shortage of practices, it's not a shortage of trainings, but really we're not, we're not dealing with the underlying situation. So the, the nice thing about thinking about structure as a leverage point is actually, it actually it improves the ability for our practices to stick and have sustainable change. Right, so uh, SCARF model, so I just want to review a couple models that help inform how I think about this. Uh, SCARF, uh, it's basically a, an acronym, and uh, it, it talks about how, how humans, how we humans, uh, deal with threats and possible uh, uh, problems to our identity. And so uh, you can see the, the status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness. So how any particular one change uh, works with a person. So some of us are higher on one of the axes than others, but it's going to, it's going to, either induce a threat response or a reward response. And if you know some brain science, brain studies that have happened in the last five, 10 years, you might know that the, the response in the brain to threats to these things is very closely related to your physical pain response. So when we are introducing change and heedless of someone, how it's affecting someone's uh, sense for certainty or sense for status, um, that person can actually experience that change almost as a physical, painful experience. So uh, we think about, we're just, we're just telling people about Agile. Well, it's not always that way. Sometimes it's actually very painful uh, for, for someone to, to deal with that, especially if they're higher on, on one of these, um, uh, on the spectrums here. All right, so uh, this is not a new model, but I, it's, a, it's a helpful one for me just because uh, it helps we make sense of what's going on in the organizations we're helping. And so this idea is that uh, there's different stages of organizational uh, life cycle, and it's kind of like a punctuated gradualism of improvement, right? So the, the longer, the older the organization, you might also correlate this with size of an organization. 
at each of these intervals or each of these these inflection points, what's needed to surmount that uh, that difficulty or that that inflection point is fundamentally the wrong thing that's needed to get past the next one. And so, if we think about fitness for purpose or kind of this idea of uh, an evolutionary type ad adaptation of an organization, the organization is is perfectly fit for getting past the previous stage, but fundamentally unfit for getting past the next one. So just think about that in terms of leadership, who's, who's here, and what's, what are the culture, what, what are all those structures that have evolved to help the organization get past the previous step. We're gonna have to look at, look at those things in a new light to be able to get past the next stage. Right, so uh, Machiavelli, so uh, just to kind of remind us, it's not quite as easy. Uh, there's nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success and to take the lead in the introduction of new, a new order of things. So, anybody still want to do this with me? <laughs> All right, so we want to make it easy. That's, 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 that's what we we're here uh, to do. So, I want to talk about just a few little enablers. So, think about these as prerequisites, not only for the practice of uh, Henko Kantan, uh, but also as for us to be aware of as, as change agents. All right, so uh, this is actually an interesting uh, uh, technique that uh, I learned about from uh, the book about Netflix culture. It's called uh, No Rules Rules. Uh, for us as change agents, we typically view the world from our own perspective, our own kind of, whether it's a, our own national culture, our own family culture, our own just personality. And this is a way to kind of create some objectivity around what's going on in the landscape that we see before we even start doing anything. All right, so that's why I consider it a prerequisite. Uh, so Netflix has uh, a, a concept or a practice. It's, it's called the informed captain rule. So basically, they say, we're going to have one person and one person only responsible for making decisions. Now, you, you need to inform yourself. You need to be an informed captain. But it's one person's responsibility. Okay, that sounds interesting. It worked for a while in a US-based context when they're out in, they're in California. When they started expanding to the world, they opened offices in some of the countries you see here. And notably, you can see a couple of the countries are much higher on, say, the deciding scale. And so what they found was that when they tried to use this practice, hey, this is a good practice, the informed captain rule. Um, it was very difficult for cultures that had a more consensual style of uh, making decisions. So just being aware of that and being aware of your own culture, your own organization, I, I would say take a map, make a simple map, whether you use these axes or not, but just understand what it is we're getting into. All right, so uh, I don't know if you, anyone knows the, uh, the famous... Uh, Painting by Magritte, Rene Magritte. It says, "Ceci n'est pas une pipe." This is not a pipe. <laughs> right? It's a picture of a pipe, and it says, "This is not a pipe." Uh, that's what I think about when I see the corporate values on the walls. All right. Uh, and I have a theory. I haven't tested this, but uh, it's that the older an organization is, or the the more legacy an organization is, the the less reliable the values are. Right? <laughs> They're more aspirational values, maybe we'll say. Right? So, uh, so one of the things is, so I'm from the Midwest in the United States, and so we're, we're kind of trusting a bunch of people, but my state is called, it's called the show me state. I come from Missouri, and our motto is the show me state. So I need to kind of check into this, this Missourian skepticism to say, when, what you see on the wall is not really what's going on here in the culture. Right? It, it, you, it's okay to be uh, skeptical of that, about that. So the, the values are not necessarily the values. So just kind of go in with that, that uh, assumption. Uh, empathy. Uh, so as excited change agents, we have a lot of great things to offer people. Right? We're, we, we know some of these things work. We're excited to help people. Uh, and so we just oftentimes barge in. So uh, this is a, a, a cube uh, from a man named Irwin. So I was, this is a few years ago. I was invited to help lead this transformation. So they were going to take one team, handpicked of all the best people around the department, and Erwin was this more senior developer who, he was about ready to retire. And I could see in his eyes 
as soon as they said, oh, we, we're picking you, Erwin, because you're, you're awesome. And he's like, oh, this is the, this agile thing. It's the latest flavor. I just want to retire. He had his, his cube was all kitted out. He had multiple monitors. He had multiple computers. Everything was just right for him. And here management was telling him, hey, we're doing this agile thing, and you need to come to the team room. And of course, I, I was excited because I love team rooms. I love informed workspaces. I love the dynamics of, of being together, working uh, shoulder to shoulder. But I knew it was not working for Erwin. So <laughs> rather than say, hey, Erwin, you need to get with the program, I, 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 I took him aside and I said, Erwin, I, I get this. Like, this is probably your worst nightmare. And I wish I could take you, you know, give you a chance to get off the team. But your organization wants you because you're good. And I said, if you could just kind of honor some of the things, come to the morning stand up, and then you can go back to your desk because I, I know that's where you're, that's your happy place. And it was like something turned on with him. He, 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 he saw that I was trying to like, see him as a fellow human. <laughs> And, and so the first day, we all gathered around. You know, there's a lot of people excited, a lot of people watching what's going on here, this kind of fishbowl. And Erwin comes to the stand-up. And so I was just kind of waiting to see what he would do. And stand-up broke, and people went to the desks, and a couple of guys started pairing. And he went over, and he said, oh, what are you guys, what are you guys working on? And he, they invited him to sit down. And he spent the whole rest of the day there. He spent the whole rest of the next six months there. And within a week, he had taken all of his stuff out of his, this is, I, I love this picture. You can't quite see the dust accumulating on his, on his table, but there was actual dust. And so and this is one of my favorite pictures. It looks quite lame, actually, just out of context. But it's one of my favorite pictures because Erwin, just a little act of empathy allowed Erwin to, uh, to come into the change. OK, uh, we all talk about psychological safety. The thing I don't see quite as often is actually measuring safety or really getting a sense of, do we have safety? We talk about it. It's great. Uh, but uh, just a couple of things you can do. Safety checks. And uh, again, a, a lot of leaders aren't familiar with how to do this. I Actually, the, I was working with my own leadership team, and our kind of uh, next level leader was in the, in the group with us. And, and I said, well, let's do it. Well, actually, my manager invited me to do a safety check. And so I did a safety check. And his manager was there and said, oh, this is really interesting. I'm going to try this with my leadership team. And so uh, just giving people an opportunity to, to say, well, everyone's safe here. That's, well, that's not quite good enough. Um, the other is safety scan. So this comes from Fearless Organization, actually measuring these things. I, I take my own uh, monthly <laughs> safety scan to see how psychologically safe am I. And uh, anyway, so it's, it's possible to measure these things these days. So. Uh, psychological safety for any kind of change is important. Okay, now on to some hacks so we can practice uh, doing uh, Henko Kantan. Uh, does anybody know what this is? Yeah, okay. I, I think of this as uh, the, the Agile Rorschach test. So, um, again, think about the culture that you're introducing change into. Uh, when you start using Agile language, people are going to hear those words and they're going to see whatever they want to see. Right? So if you say we're having a planning meeting or if we're having a stand-up meeting, it's, and if, you, if you're introducing this into a control and kind of micromanage culture, people are going to hear that as, oh, this is my chance to kind of micromanage the team or have control over them. Right? So these days, I try to avoid language, as Martin Fowler calls it, the semantic diffusion of words. So words that once upon a time had common, interesting, good meaning, like agile. Uh, <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> All right, Kanban is another one of these. Uh, even even coach. Sometimes I don't even introduce myself as an agile or a coach. I just say I'm here to help. <laughs> and they're like, "What's your what's your job title?" Uh, anyway, uh, uh, no, just because people ha have connotations for these things, right? Like like a lot of people have experienced coaches as people coming by with a clipboard saying, "Are you doing these practices?" And, oh, by the way, thank you very much. We don't need your help, right? So uh, it's kind of just coming off that language and not creating additional unnecessary uh, um, emotional resistance is, is helpful. All right, so uh, does anybody know what this is? I mentioned Martin Fowler. If you know Martin Fowler, you probably know this. What is it? The Strangler Fig. The strangler fig. What's, the, what's the interesting thing about that? About, 
Yeah, strangler pattern, he uses it in code. But the idea is that there's an existing tree, and then this, this, this strangler fig comes and grows around it. So if you're familiar with this concept of, it's an economic concept of loss aversion. So we as humans, we are susceptible to loss aversion, which basically means we value things we already have twice as much as things we might have. This is important in change because people are twice as much resistant to trying something new if, you, if they still have the old thing. Right? So the, the way I, I, I'm thinking about this these days is really to construct something before removing something from them, right? So avert loss aversion. Um, it, it's, it's hard. Uh, okay, six team conditions, just designing. This is a, something that's come around, I don't know, in the last five years, I think. Uh, just to kind of give us a sense, so much of what we, we see can be um, helped with a little bit of uh, thinking ahead of time. And so if you're familiar with, with, this, with their work, this is some interesting research about the effectiveness of coaching. So uh, I don't know if you think of yourself as a, as a if, you're, if you do coaching work, if you're an if you're effective coach or not an effective coach, but basically, in any case, a well-designed team, coaching, if we're, if we're throwing coaching at something, we're going to get much more bang for the buck if it's a well-designed team. Right, okay, uh, our, next, our next hack is making visible the unseen things, the unseen motivators that are in our system. So if you're, if you're down here, you say, ah, I, I'm... I'm I'm a good spirited coach. I just want to help people. Uh, okay, that's great. But you're blind to what's going on in the other people's minds and what's going on in their own worlds. And so you might have this goal in mind. And we say, let's, let's agile. Let's, let's do agile, whatever that is. Right? But meanwhile, the other people that you're working with in your system have different motivators, different things pulling on them. Uh, like my friend that I, I said just started a job not too long ago. Uh, so one person might really be under under the gun to prove that this a model works right so what does that mean uh, another person might just say we just need to increase the number of agile teams just get, you know increase our our total count so you can already see there's maybe some conflict going on here these people have different motivators different needs so making those things visible and that's even if they're able to fully articulate or be honest about those things we might actually have even hidden or under uh, that layer, things going on. Like, I just, I need, a, I, need, I need to get a promotion or I need to justify our, our budget. All right, so finding a common answer to these things, once we get these things visualized, made them on the, on the table, then we can see, ah, is there something that we can find, some kind of small change that allows us to satisfy all the goals that we actually have, even if our goals going in are not necessarily aligned? Uh, Salesforce is, is pretty well known for, the, for doing this kind of thing. They have a very highly transparent uh, uh, internal wiki that shows all the, everyone in the organization uh, and their, they call it V2MOM, which is kind of a, a silly acronym, but it's easy to remember, I guess. Uh, vision, values, methods, obstacles, and measures. So everyone can see how they're related and what's going on. And so it, it, it's like one step closer to making this, this kind of stuff transparent. Okay, so this is, the, this is a, a new pattern I'm trying. Uh, it's the, the Henko Kantan pattern, right? So it's, basically, it's pretty simple. It kind of draws on some of the things you've probably seen before. But basically, we'd like to see uh, someone, uh, some kind of behavior change. And we hope it would result in this kind of outcome. And the thing that makes this difficult now, and this is where we have to kind of take this approach of uh, obliquity, so the idea of pursuing a goal indirectly. So oftentimes, the thing that's inhibiting us is not the thing that presents itself above the surface. Uh, so uh, identifying what that thing is, so, so instead we'll try this easy change. And then we'll all know we're on the right track if we get some early signal. So here's an example. Uh, we'd like to see team leaders cooperate more, uh, which we hope would result in teams coordinating to deliver features, like completed features, not just individual bits of stuff that's never integrated or never actually done. And the thing that makes it difficult now is that our leaders actually, when we look below the surface, our leaders have individual goals. And so, you know, this isn't in the Agile textbook, right? It doesn't say like, uh, uh, make sure your leaders have shared goals. I mean, you can kind of derive that. Uh, so instead we'll try writing goals that the team leaders all share, they have in common. And then we'll, we'll get a signal if, if teams are actually finishing work uh, that would be helpful. Here's another one. Uh, we'd like to see managers lead more and micromanage less. And we want to have our people be more innovative. And so if you have a system that where the managers are forced to force rank their employees performance-wise, 
right? That, that's a huge inhibitor. All the, ad, the great agile practices you could sprinkle on people, if you could undo this thing, you could probably save all the time and effort in training people. It's a high leverage change, right? Um, and then we're going to just try temporarily suspending that. So thinking of this as, a, in as an experiment. All right, speaking of experiments, again, this is a way to kind of just make it easier for people. Small experiments, uh, probes even, just trying things. Uh, I, I tried something recently. Uh, so uh, different companies have different cultures. Uh, I personally, I'm not big on like status, recognition, certs, badges, and all these things. But some people are. Some, some cultures, that's a, a big thing, right? So uh, I, I was really concerned that a lot of people were spending like their full days. They were like, I don't have any time. I'm just going back-to-back -back meetings. You've maybe heard this. And so I'm like, how do, I, how do I get people to make space in their daily schedule? And so one thing I could do, I could just tell them, hey, it, there's a lot of good research that says you need to do deep work. You know, you're, you're more creative when you have a solid block of time. That doesn't work uh, in, in a culture where status and recognition. So what I did is uh, a little probe. I, I made a, a channel on Teams, and I call it the 50% Club. And I said, anyone who has a day of work where you have 50% of your time free for meetings, you get to be in the club. And, and lo and behold, it's, uh, people are interested, right? So it was a little probe to see what, what's going on, what, what, what happens to a particular, in a particular culture that I need to tap into. All right, uh, I think I told the story about my friend Leonidas the other day. I'll, I'll keep going because I think time is short. Uh, Ulysses contracts. The story of Ulysses, what happens? Any classics scholars? Ulysses, uh, Circe's, yeah, what? Yeah, it's a, it's a long story, yeah, okay. Yeah, so this is uh, he, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Sirens. He goes by the island, island of the Sirens. Circe's has warned him, uh, you need to be careful because you'll be shipwrecked. Uh, what, what does Circe's say to do? Put wax in your, your ears, or yeah, in, in, your, oh, in your people, your uh, shipmates' ears, and and have them tie you to the mast, right? So he can hear the sweet music of the sirens, uh, but he, they won't get shipwrecked, right? So he uses information ahead of time to do the right behavior. So this is what, the idea is that making it easy to do the right thing and harder to do the wrong thing. So this is kind of like a premeditated uh, dis discipline to say, here's the change I want to have. So for me, a couple of years ago, I, I read about the value of doing a, like a daily gratitude journal. It's like, oh, sounds good. It's kind of like our New Year's resolutions, you know, all these good things. Uh, how am I going to make that change happen? Well, for me, I have a personal Kanban. And so I knew that if I would hack into that existing habit and I would just make a daily card pop up that says daily gratitude journal, boom, that I do the things in my, daily, or my personal Kanban. And lo and behold, I've been doing it ever since, right? So make it easy to do the right thing. Ulysses contract. Okay, so I just want to encourage everybody to be, oh, thanks. I, I wasn't ignoring you guys. I, I know time is winding down. We're in extra time. Uh, so I, I want to encourage you to be an environmentalist. All right, so this is a man, this is a, a Guillaume Gonet. He, he owns a winery in France. Uh, he's a lovely man, but uh, he takes care of his, his vineyard, uh, not because, not just kind of making sure everything looks good above the surface, but he takes care of what's going on below. And so I want to encourage everybody here to be an environmentalist. Pay attention to the environment that you're working in. When you're doing change, think about the structures. Think about what's happening, uh, not just the practices, but what's, what's in the soil. So I think that's it. I don't know if, maybe, no, stop now. What? No. <laughs> All right, thank you, everyone.